And vMotion is very special because it allows us that flexibility from the hardware that is one of the main features of virtualization all the way around. So let's go ahead, I'm gonna jump into the slides here so we can take a look at what this looks like, technically speaking. So what is vMotion? vMotion moves a virtual machine from one host to another in our environment. And we can do this in a powered off, which many of you would probably expect, and a live or powered on setting as well. That usually blows people's minds when we first mention, who, who are not really used to virtualization, they kind of stop and take a moment to think about that. A virtual machine that is running on one host in your environment is going to move to another completely different physical host in my environment while it is still powered on without losing any data, without losing customer connectivity. That's a big deal. And this is one of those things that opened up the world to us as far as our uptime is concerned. Because in the past, we never had the ability to do this, right? And if I needed to perform any maintenance whatsoever on a particular host, what happened is I had to power down that host, power down that service, and lose uptime until I got that host fixed or until that host was upgraded. That is no longer the case within our virtual environment. We can move a virtual machine across hosts, even though it's powered on, no downtime incurred. Huge deal. Now, in order to make this work, we need to make sure that we've configured something on each one of our hosts. And that is the VM, vMotion VM kernel port. That has to be active. Think of that as the actual switch that turns on the ability to vMotion. We must make sure that we also are on the same subnet for our vMotion VM kernel. Our source and destination must be on the same subnet. When we do this, when we're on the same subnet, our IP address must be on the same subnet, but it must be unique within that subnet. So if I'm on the 10.0.0 network, that's my subnet, 10.0.0, and I have one of these hosts set up as 10.0.0.158, and that's my vMotion VM kernel port group. The other host, the destination, or the other host in my environment cannot be set up with 10.0.0.148. They still have to be in the 10.0.0 network. They just have to have a unique ending IP address. Those of, you, those, those of you from a networking background, that sounded obvious. But remember, this is VMware. Not everyone is a networking person. Not everyone's a storage person. Not any, everyone's a server administration. So I have to explain some of these basic concepts, even though it seems really easy to some of you. Some of you may be struggling with that. So once we've turned the switch on, we are able to vMotion, we have to make sure that we have compute resources that are similar, right? And not just similar, but within the same families at the very least. That means if I'm going to do a live vMotion, and this only applies to a live vMotion, my host is AMD on one side, it needs to be AMD on the other. If I'm doing an Intel on one side, it needs to be Intel on the other. If I'm powered off, it's not such a big deal. But powered on vMotions do require that the compute resources be within the same family, if not even the same model. And we can use enhanced vMotion compatibility to help this out, but family to family is very much a, a line in the sand. So make sure that it's AMD to AMD or Intel to Intel. Last but not least, we also need shared storage. A shared storage location makes things much, much easier. We can implement uh, storage vMotion as well, but if we have shared storage, that facilitates the move much, much better, and our live migrations can happen once we have shared storage. If we don't have shared storage, live migrations are not possible. So what are some of the limitations of vMotion? Sounds great, you know, it, it, perfect. What are the drawbacks? Well, first off, I can only do this within IP families. I cannot do a vMotion on IPv4 on one side on, to IPv6 on the other side. There is no uh, NAT in between there that's going to make that work. So make sure that we're in the same IP family for that VM kernel port group, right? For the VM kernel port group. Also, we can't have any no raw disks. 
If we have a clustered environment, we can't have our raw disk mapping in place. That creates problem when we do our vMotion. Uh, ZP, CPU counter compatibility, our GPU, there must be a GPU. If we've enabled GPU, we can vMotion with the GPU. Just make sure that the GPU is available on the other side. Virtual back devices must be reachable on the destination. Flash read cache must be also available on the destination side. And then our, our vMotion limitations for the amount of vMotions that can actually take place. For a one gigabit connection, we can do four concurrent vMotions. For a 10 gigabit connection, we can do eight concurrent vMotions. So we have some flexibility on the number of vMotions we're gonna do, but one of, when this really comes into play is DRS. DRS, that clustering system, uses vMotion. So a lot of these restrictions are gonna to apply to DRS as well. And if I have multiple virtual machines on a specific host, the DRS is gonna move off at the same time. I have to make sure my networking can handle it. In this case, one gigabit connection, four at a time, 10 gigabit, eight at a time. Now we talked about enhanced vMotion compatibility. Let's go ahead and look at that a little more closely. This allows us feature parity between CPUs and not between families of CPUs. I'm not talking AMD to Intel here. If I'm doing a live migration, that's completely off the table. But if I'm doing an Intel to Intel migration and I have different model numbers on different sides, that is when I can use enhanced vMotion to bring down the feature set to my lowest common denominator. So we're limited to the processor family. It brings the feature set down to the lowest common denominator in our environments. And it enable, basically what it does is enables vMotion to take place between two hosts in our environment that could be wildly different, but still within the same family of processors being offered. We can enable this at a cluster level, and it should be enabled on a cluster level if you have different uh, versions of a CPU in that particular cluster. Now, I am an advocate of building a cluster as similarly as possible. If you have one side of your cluster configured with one model number of a CPU and the other side of a cluster in a different family, AMD, and completely different model, that's not gonna work out well. That cluster is supposed to be a place where virtual machines can flow back and forth without causing any issues. By putting two different family types of processors in there, you're automatically creating pockets in which the virtual machines can't flow across. Next up, we have storage vMotion. Now, storage vMotion is a really cool feature that allows us to vMotion files between different data stores. This can happen again in a live or powered off setting. So two terabyte limit when we're going from VM VMFS five to VMFS three, and we must have access to the start and endpoint. So our compute resource, our host, must have access to both sides of things. So I mentioned earlier, and some of you guys might have said, wait a second, Russ, you said that shared storage is required. That's true because it has to be available to the compute resource on both sides of the, for it to work. So let's, let's clarify it a little bit, okay? So here's our compute resource. This is our host. Let's say this is host one. In order to do a storage vMotion, host one must have access to data store one and data store two. Now that doesn't seem like such a big deal. The storage of emotion is fine and none of those have to be shared. But let's take into account this. Let's say we have another host. And we're gonna go ahead and call this host two. Host two is also, we're gonna do a compute vMotion as well. So we're gonna move this virtual machine over here and we're gonna move its, ver its uh, VMX and VMDK file over to DS2. So we're starting at host one on DS1, and we're gonna live migrate this virtual machine to H2 and DS2. Well, for in order for this to work, the host one must have access to DS1 and DS2, but also host two must have access to DS1 
and DS2. And that's where my requirement for shared storage comes in because both hosts in this case would have to have access. If I was just doing a plain old storage vMotion, we wouldn't need shared storage here. And the same goes for the other direction. If I was only doing a, a compute resource movement, as long as I, both hosts had access to the storage, we would be fine as well. So that's how storage vMotion works. That's how uh, our shared storage comes into play. We have to have access to both sides as we're doing this transfer, because remember, this isn't a live setting we're talking about. And when we're live, we have to make sure that everything works well. I'm sorry, we had a little blackout there for a second. It seems to have recovered. Uh, it looks good. In our next little lesson, I'm actually going to do a demonstration of this and show you the VMX and VMDK files and how to do a manual vMotion, which uh, not many instructors teach you out there. So it should be a lot of fun. Uh, enjoy and take, take a moment to think about your storage infrastructure and your compute infrastructure, what is accessible and what's not, and that'll give you an idea of what live vMotions are, are possible in your environment.